Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Samwick, and I'm the director of the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center and a professor of economics here at Dartmouth. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's lecture, Character in Politics by Ramesh Panuru. Today's event is part of the Brooks Family Lecture Series, through which the Rockefeller Center seeks to foster a balanced discussion of national and international issues. We also continue our celebration of the Rockefeller Center's 35th anniversary, and I encourage you to visit our website, rockefeller.dartmouth.edu, to stay abreast of our programming this fall. Our topic today is well-timed. We are living through a period in which the character our, of our politics is changing rapidly and not for the better. When I consider the politicians in my lifetime who have impressed me as men and women of character, I put Senator Paul Songus at the top of my list. A member of the Dartmouth class of 1962, he ran unsuccessfully for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1992. I'd like to quote to you briefly from his Call to Economic Arms, a white paper he circulated during that campaign. Quoting him, the normal political instinct is to always engage in happy talk. It is courage which allows a politician to take a people beyond that. It takes toughness to lead a people toward their preservation, no matter how disquieting the journey may be. For avoidance of unpleasant reality is simply part of human nature. A candid assessment of our politics today is just the opposite. Happy talk and the avoidance of unpleasant reality, although not the avoidance of unpleasantness. The absence of the courage to move beyond that and the opposite of toughness on matters of societal preservation. And I would argue that the stakes are quite high, too high for us to tolerate the absence of character in politics much longer. Writing in 2005 in her book, Dark Age Ahead, Jane Jacobs noted, writing, printing, and the internet give a false sense of security about the permanence of culture. Most of the million details of a complex living culture are transmitted neither in writing nor pictorially. Instead, cultures live through word of mouth and example. What is the word of mouth? What are the examples we are setting for ourselves, for our children, for our potential allies and adversaries around the globe? How can we allow our governing institutions to display such character and think that there won't be dire consequences in our near future? We are fortunate to have with us this afternoon Ramesh Panuro to discuss the role of character in our political lives. A keen observer of politics and economics, Mr. Panuro is the senior editor at National Review, where he has covered national politics and policy for more than 20 years. He is also a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, uh, which syndicates his articles in newspapers across the nation, and in fact, possibly in your hometown. A graduate of Princeton University, he is a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and he serves as a contributing editor to National Affairs, the Quarterly Journal of Conservative Ideas. Mr. Panuro is a contributor to Face the Nation on CBS. In 2015, he was included in the Politico 50, Politico's list of the thinkers, doers, and dreamers who really matter in American politics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ramesh Panuro. Thank you, uh, Andrew, for that generous introduction. Thank you to the Rockefeller Center and the Brooks family for hosting my uh, visit here, my first visit to Dartmouth, um, and uh, one of the only times I've been in New Hampshire not covering a presidential race. I appreciate that as well. Um, thank you all for uh, for coming out. As they um, say on the uh, uh, flights, I, I know you had other options. Oh, and uh, you know what? I'm going to just make sure my phone is off just in case the president texts me again. <laughs> uh, great. Uh, he's always doing that. The character issue is, once again, at the forefront of American politics. The personal traits of political candidates are, of course, always an important element in their appeal to voters, and they're frequently debated. Was Bill Clinton sincere when he said that he felt our pain? Was it a good thing if he did? Was George W. Bush too callow for the office of the presidency? Did Mitt Romney, as the pollsters asked, care about people like you? Was Hillary Clinton, as Barack Obama put it, 
likable enough. Elections are never solely about records and platforms. What's different about this moment is that the character of the incumbent president has become the dominant issue of our politics. The goal of Donald Trump's presidency often seems to be to make Trump the center of every conversation. If so, it must be said that this is one more unlikely ambition in which Trump has to an astonishing degree succeeded. Controversy about policies has, of course, not disappeared. The opposition to President Trump is vociferous in its disapproval of nearly all of his policies. But its most widespread and deepest criticism of President Trump does not concern the tax bill that he signed, the Supreme Court justices that he's nominated, or even his immigration views. It concerns his character, what his critics take to be his boorishness, his mistreatment of women, his dishonesty, his impulsiveness, and more. And when we listen to the right of center voices who frequently criticize the president, the people who are often described as never Trump conservatives, we hear the same phenomenon. Some of them disagree with his position on guns or on immigration. Many of them oppose him on trade. What all of them have in common is the view that Trump's character renders him unfit for office. It has sometimes been tempting for the president and his defenders to write off these criticisms as the obsession of the chattering classes. And it is certainly true that most people don't react as strongly to every presidential tweet as my fellow political journalists do. But the evidence suggests that the character question also looms large in the public's assessment of this presidency. The economy is doing well, as Trump and his allies regularly note. While we continue to have troops in harm's way, we are at relative peace. No obvious crisis affecting the welfare of large numbers of Americans has begun or significantly worsened on Trump's watch. Yet the polls on average have shown Trump's job approval over the last year to be moving in a narrow range from the high 30s to the low 40s. And they've consistently shown that a majority of Americans disapproves of his performance. The simplest explanation for the president's unpopularity under the country's current circumstances is that a lot of people find him personally objectionable. The pollsters at Quinnipiac University, among others, have asked questions that shed light on the public view of Trump's character. They find that most Americans reject the propositions that he is honest, has good leadership skills, cares about average Americans, is level-headed, shares their values, has a sense of decency, or serves as a good role model for children. Interestingly, most Americans do not agree with another widespread attack on the president. They believe he's intelligent. Overall, only 27% of people, according to Quinnipiac's latest finding, say that they are proud to have Trump as their president, while 49% say they're embarrassed. The negative view is, of course, as that suggests, by no means universal. On each of the tested questions, a majority of self-described Republicans offers a favorable answer. Thus, four-fifths of Republicans say the president is honest, two-thirds say he's level-headed, three-fifths say he's a good role model for kids. Even among Republicans, however, fewer people are willing to say that Trump has the positive traits in question than are willing to say that they approve of the job that he's doing. About a fifth of Republicans think that he's doing a good job as president, but don't consider him a role model for children. Thus, there's a tripartite division of opinion on the character issue as it bears on President Trump. The largest group of Americans has a low opinion of his character and base their opposition to him in important part on that appraisal. A second group views him favorably, both personally and politically. And a third group, the smallest one, has a low opinion of him, but doesn't give it decisive weight when considering his tenure in office. The debate over the relevance of character to politics is a very long-standing one. It's one on which our founders had quite a lot to say, directly and indirectly. Take, for example, Federalist 51. 
Speaking of the Constitution's checks and balances, Madison writes, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place oblige it to control itself. Madison then proceeds to explain that making the government dependent on the public is an inf insufficient solution to this problem, which also requires what he calls auxiliary precautions that can do their work when people's motives are less than angelic. As Madison puts it in the other Federalist paper that students are most likely to read, number 10, enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. Americans have been debating these ideas and their implications ever since. Roughly 100 years later, the poet and journalist James Russell Lowell decried what he took to be the widespread view that the founders had, quote, invented a machine that would go of itself. A view that implies that neither the people nor government office holders need possess and exercise Republican virtues, or even perhaps have a deep understanding of the Constitution, the mechanisms of which they employ. Many words and deeds of various founders can be adduced to suggest that the mechanistic view is a misinterpretation of their work. We have John Adams's warning as president that avarice, ambition, revenge, and licentiousness would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. There's also Madison's attack in yet another Federalist, number 45, on those who would reject the Constitution to protect the prerogatives of state governments. Madison wrote, it is too early for politicians to presume on our forgetting that the public good, the real welfare of the great body of the people, is the supreme object to be pursued, and that no form of government whatever has any other value than as it may be fitted for the attainment of this object. So right before that passage, Madison had invoked the precious blood of thousands spilt in the revolution. The shared experience of the war had enlarged the public view. But we might forget. We might sink into short-sighted sectarianism. A certain degree of virtue on the part of the public was needed, in other words, for the Constitution to be adopted in the first place. And whether the public would have the requisite virtue was subject to historical contingency. An enlightened public, evidently, would not always be at the helm. Politicians, moreover, could encourage the public to raise its sights or to lower them. We also know, beyond those words, that the founders joined the public of the time in having a nearly universal respect for George Washington, and in particular for his repeated example of renouncing power. His decision not to run for a third term has been considered for most of American history to have established a norm conducive to good government, but one that was not part of the Constitution's explicit checks and balances. At the same time, we know that many of the founders, including Washington, fell far short of what we now understand and what they themselves generally understood the virtue of justice to require. I speak, of course, of their involvement in the sordid and cruel trade in men, women, and children. The question of how this moral defect should affect our view of their statesmanship is being reassessed in our own time. In recent years, which I will conveniently define to coincide with my own journalistic career, covering the span from Bill Clinton's administration to Donald Trump's, Public argument about character and virtue in politics has tended to dwell on questions that overlap with but are somewhat different from those that occupied the founders. To what extent does the character of someone who holds high office matter? Which traits matter? Is there a distinction 
between private and public vices, such that the private ones, such as serial infidelity within marriage, should be considered none of the public's concern. Is character destiny, as one poll of this debate has it, or do only results matter, as the other holds? What I propose this afternoon is to track some of the twists and turns that the contemporary argument is taking. For those of us who are old enough to pay attention during the Clinton administration, the current debate has a familiar feel, but with the sides reversed. Sometimes this reversal can be seen in the rhetoric of individual people. William Bennett, the Secretary of Education under President Reagan, the author of The Book of Virtues, The Death of Outrage, and other works, spoke in opposition to Clinton's reelection in 1996. Should character matter in this campaign, he asked. It's an indication of the difficulties this country is in that people ask the question, what is more important than the character of our president? In 1999, on the eve of the Senate's 50-50 vote on removing Clinton from office, Bennett lamented the American public support for him, calling it an ignoble moment for a great people. Bennett has, in contrast, been a strong supporter of President Trump. Those who oppose him because of his character, he says, suffer from a terrible case of moral superiority and put their own vanity and taste above the interest of the country. A similar shift in opinion has happened among conservative Protestants and has inspired a fair amount of comment. In 1998, at the height of the scandal related to Clinton's affair with Monica Lewinsky, the Southern Baptist Convention passed a resolution affirming, quote, that moral character matters to God and should matter to all citizens, especially God's people, when choosing public leaders. Further, the Baptists, quote, implored our government leaders to live by the highest standards of morality, both in their private actions and in their public duties, and thereby serves, serve as models of moral excellence and character, and submit themselves respectfully to governing authorities and to the rule of law. The Baptists finished by urging all Americans to embrace and to act on the conviction that character does count in public office and to elect those officials and candidates who, although imperfect, demonstrate consistent honesty, moral purity, and the highest character. This view persisted among conservative Protestants for many years following the Clinton administration. In 2011, the Public Religion Research Institute surveyed Americans on whether they believe that an elected official who commits an immoral act in their personal life can still behave ethically and fulfill their duties in their public and professional life. They were split, with 44% saying yes and 44% saying no. Respondents who identified themselves as white evangelical Protestants were tougher on the politicians. Only 30% of them thought that someone could commit transgressions in his personal life, yet serve the public well. Five years later, the same institute asked the same question. It was the closing days of the 2016 campaign. There was a very different answer. The public had become more latitudinarian, and white evangelical Christians had led the way. Over five years, what had been a 30% minority, distinguishing between a politician's private character and his fitness for office, a 30% minority of evangelicals, that is, had become a 72% majority. White evangelical Christians were now significantly more likely to make this distinction than other Americans were. Prominent evangelical figures gave this new sentiment voice during 2016. At the time of the Republican primaries that spring, Jerry Falwell Jr., the president of Liberty University, said, God called King David a man after God's own heart, even though he was an adulterer and a murderer. You have to choose the leader that would make the best king or president, and not necessarily someone who would be a good pastor. We're not voting for pastor in chief. It means sometimes we have to choose a person who has the qualities to lead and who can protect our country and bring us back to economic vitality, and it might not be the person we call when we need somebody to give us spiritual counsel. The biblical gloss differentiated Falwell's case for Trump from the case that liberals had made for Clinton during the 1990s. Their argument instead tended to dwell on the greater sophistication with which Europeans greeted such stories. But the argument that only some of a person's qualities are relevant to an evaluation of him as a potential or actual officeholder, that was the same. 
But it's not only on the evangelical right that the passage of time and altered circumstances have worked to change in view. Among liberals, too, there's been a reevaluation of an old position. In their case, the defense of Bill Clinton. In November of last year, the liberal commentator Matthew Iglesias wrote on Vox, at the time, I, like most Americans, was glad to see Clinton prevail and regarded the whole sordid matter, sordid matter as primarily the fault of congressional Republicans' excessive scandal mongering. Now, looking back after the election of Donald Trump, the revelations of massive sexual harassment scandals at Fox News, the stories about Harvey Weinstein and others in the entertainment industry, and the stories about Roy Moore's pursuit of sexual relationships with teenagers, I think we got it wrong. Iglesias now thinks that Clinton abused his power over Monica Lewinsky and should have resigned over it. Writing in Politico, Jeff Greenfield, a liberal journalist who started his career writing speeches for Robert F. Kennedy, argued that Democrats and liberals needed to perform a painful re-examination of their support for Clinton and even for John F. Kennedy. He brought up, as an embarrassment, how Gloria Steinem had defended Clinton from the charge of having sexually harassed Kathleen Wiley and Paula Jones. Clinton, Steinem had written, had made clumsy passes and then accepted rejection. Even at the time, Greenfield writes, Steinem's standard was labeled the one free grope rule. The new liberal thinking, as both of those writers acknowledge, is a response to the Me Too movement and its exposure of widespread sexual abuse by powerful men. But that movement itself, as Iglesias suggests, is in part a response to Trump's election. Even as the liberal pressure for Senator Al Franken to resign after several women made allegations of unwanted physical contact against him was a response to the then pending election in which Roy Moore was running. One need not doubt the sincerity of liberal revisionism to register its convenience. It avoids hypocrisy by means of a retrospective consistency. The mostly positive reception of the film Chappaquiddick is another case in point. Liberal positions in long dead controversies are abandoned in order to vindicate liberal positions in today's live controversies. But whatever one thinks of the motivations behind these dual shifts in partisan positions, that they have taken place is undeniable. It's possible to argue for either one of these shifts. One could argue that on the left, there's a new and welcome sensitivity to the public ramifications of seemingly private character flaws. Alternatively, perhaps the right has reached a mature realism about the imperfections of politics in a fallen world. In either case, the fact remains. On the relevance of character to politics, the parties have switched sides. So my discussion so far has mostly abstracted from the particulars of the character controversies concerning Clinton and Trump. One way of distinguishing the cases, and thus of defending a stance of support for one and opposition to the other, is to say that there are significant differences between their behavior that justify differing responses. And as one would expect, there are differences that might be considered relevant to a moral evaluation. For example, while both men committed adultery and have been accused by multiple women of harassment, some of Clinton's conduct and alleged conduct occurred when he was president, and the same isn't true of Trump. Leaving aside the infidelity and alleged harassment that I've already mentioned, Clinton was condemned by those who condemned him for avoiding the draft, for indiscipline and poor management, for dishonesty, or a habit of making a kind of misleading but technically true comment for which the adjective Clintonian was invented. One critic said that he practiced serial sincerity. For perjury, subornation of perjury, and obstruction of justice, and for various forms of corruption. Incidentally, while a persistent myth has held that the Whitewater investigation never went anywhere, it did in fact lead to several convictions, including jail time for the man who was at the time the sitting governor of Arkansas, Clinton's successor in that position. Clinton was also accused of having committed a rape in the late 1970s. Now nearly all of the same charges have been made against President Trump, but he's also been subject to an extraordinarily wide range of additional criticisms based on personal traits that allegedly make or show him unfit for office. I'll try to review those criticisms with as much brevity as possible. 
and with the understanding that the list of criticisms includes items of differing moral and legal gravity. And then afterward, I'll turn to some of the arguments made in defense of Trump's character or in mitigation of his character flaws. In business, he was accused of stiffing creditors, defrauding customers, and having ties to the mob. A lawsuit for fraud against Trump University was settled for $25 million right after the election. It's a matter of public record that he tried to get the government of Atlantic City to let him bulldoze an elderly widow's house so that he could offer more parking for limousines at a casino. His philanthropic donations have come under the microscope. With critics documenting that he failed to follow through on public promises to give to charitable groups, donated a small proportion of his income, used his foundation to pay for settlements in lawsuits against his businesses, and used it as well to purchase a six-foot-tall, $20,000 portrait of himself. As a candidate and as president, he is said to be ignorant about and uninterested in public policy and the operations of government, to lack self-control, to be easily distracted, to spend too much time on the golf course and in front of the TV. I have personally never taken the time to develop an opinion about Don Lemon of CNN. Our president has. On several occasions, Trump's behavior has been characterized as indecent and cool. When he spread the baseless rumor that the father of one of his political rivals was involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy, when he distributed an unflattering picture of that same rival's wife, when he said that a judge hearing the fraud case against Trump University could not be objective because of his Mexican ancestry. A television advertisement in wide circulation during the 2016 election depicted him appearing to mock a reporter's disability. Finally, Trump has been accused of extravagant dishonesty. Again, there's a parallel to Bill Clinton, whose relationship to truth was, like other relationships of his, casual. The press has compiled long lists of alleged misstatements by Trump. Those lists should be read with adjustments for the press's sometimes antipathy to conservatives, Republicans, and Trump, an adjustment for Trump's own penchant for exaggeration, and one for the possibility that misstatements can reflect errors of memory and honest mistakes. But even with those allowances, the president makes up a lot of things. He has misrepresented his wealth. He has invented past positions, as when, during the 2016 primaries, he claimed that he had fought very, very hard against the Iraq war before it happened, and that a delegation was sent to his office to see him because he was so vocal about it. There's no record of such opposition. He has, at best, imagined scenes in which thousands and thousands of Muslims in New Jersey cheered the atrocities of September 11th, 2001. And he's repeatedly made incendiary charges for which no evidence exists, such as that his predecessor was not born in the United States and benefited from an elaborate conspiracy to hide it, and that millions and millions of illegal votes prevented him from winning the popular vote. That's the bill of indictment, so to speak. Trump supporters, and there are, of course, tens of millions of them, are familiar with it, familiar in some cases to the point of weariness, and they've mounted multiple defenses of him. Sometimes these defenses take the form of what I'm told lawyers call arguing in the alternative. So when Stephanie Clifford, a woman who performs in pornographic films, said that she had a brief relationship with Trump soon after his current wife had given birth to their son, there were people who were prepared to argue both that it didn't happen, she was lying, and that it wouldn't be so bad if it had. The Trump administration itself has taken a similar tack in other controversies. Thus, the president didn't fire James Comey as director of the FBI out of anger about the Russia investigation, and he had every right to do it anyway. So the existence of multiple and conflicting defenses of Trump is inevitable and need not imply bad faith on anyone's part since nearly 63 million Americans voted for him, and there's considerable diversity of opinion in, within that group. I already mentioned one very important division, a sizable minority of the people who approve of the job he's doing and who presumably almost all voted for him agree with a lot of the criticisms that people make of him. And it's not surprising either that the defenses would vary in quality and persuasiveness. One common tactic seems like a dodge. It pretends that the objections to Trump are purely aesthetic in nature, 
as though the critics' sensibilities were just too delicate for Trump. Some of Trump's critics do stress what they see as his vulgarity and tackiness. But to want a president to comport himself with dignity is neither fustiness nor snobbery. And the concerns about Trump's temperament and values are not reducible to the fear that he might use the wrong fork or use too much gold plating in his decor. A stronger line of defense concedes that Trump has many flaws, but urges that he be not judged more harshly than his predecessors. Charles Kessler, the editor of the Claremont Review of Books, a conservative journal, wrote during the 2016 campaign that Trump's, quote, vices have been exhaustively condemned, but never examined in comparative perspective. Do obscenities fall from his lips more readily than they did from Lyndon Johnson's or Richard Nixon's? Are the circumstances of his three marriages more shameful than the circumstances of John F. Kennedy's pathologically unfaithful one? Or, for that matter, Bill Clinton's humiliatingly unfaithful one? Have any of his egotistical excesses rivaled Andrew Jackson's killing a man in a duel over a horse racing bet and an insult to Jackson's wife? The point is not to extenuate Trump's faults, he continued, but to understand how millions of voters see him. I think the point may have also been to extenuate them. What these voters were thinking on Kessler's plausible explanation is that it would be nothing new to elect a president with serious character flaws. Robert Jeffress, the prominent evangelical Christian pastor in Dallas that I've already quoted, made a version of the same argument. He pointed out that conservative Christians backed Ronald Reagan, even though he'd been married twice. Many of them supported the thrice-married Newt Gingrich, even knowing that he'd committed adultery. To refuse to support Trump on character grounds would require what Jeffress called selective amnesia. Some say that the culture of which Trump is a part should also be considered a kind of extenuating circumstance. In their book, The Faith of Donald J. Trump, conservative Christian authors David Brody and Scott Lamb refer to Trump's listing as of his role models, a triumvirate including Clint Eastwood, Hugh Hefner, and James Bond. They note that Americans, including their fellow evangelicals, fund their culture-shaping products with their book purchases and ticket sales, and they conclude that Trump is a reflection of the times. Moreover, the voters neither punished Bill Clinton for his defects of character, nor rewarded Mitt Romney for his generally admirable character. And there's another extenuating circumstance, according to some supporters of the president, namely the fall of man. Reacting to reports that Stephanie Clifford had been paid to keep quiet about her relationship with Trump, Jeffress, our friend from Dallas, noted by way of explaining why his and other supports for the president would not waver, we're all sinners, we all need forgiveness. And besides, the enemies of the president are often worse than he is. In a column for the Wall Street Journal, William McGurn argues, that Trump's critics have encouraged insubordination in the federal bureaucracy, compared him to Hitler and Stalin, abused the courts to try to overturn his policies, and are engaged in, quote, a concerted effort to overturn the results of a legitimate presidential election. McGurn concludes, whatever the president sins, there are no excuse for not asking whether the double standards of his critics in polite society might be just as corrupting to American democracy. Some supporters of President Trump have taken another page from the Clinton book and argue that whatever one thinks of Trump the man, the results of Trump the president are worth lauding. Jobs, the size of the economy, wages, labor force participation, every economic indicator that one would want to be rising is rising. ISIS has continued to weaken. If character is destiny, then why does the country appear to be doing just fine, notwithstanding its political distempers? If we view the presidency as a job which we hire someone to perform and not as a moral example to the nation, perhaps this president deserves a higher approval rating than he's getting. Perhaps, indeed, one of the benefits of Trump's presidency is precisely that it's deflating the moral pretensions of the modern presidency. Most conservatives are pleased and have reason to be pleased with many of the policies that have been implemented or are being implemented during, president, during this presidency. Taxes have been cut, regulations restrained. The individual mandate in health care is no more. The federal bench now includes more conservative judges. 
Ann Coulter was one of Trump's earliest and most vehement supporters. She even wrote a campaign season book titled In Trump We Trust. Earlier this year, she noted that her support was transactional and without illusions. I knew he was a shallow, lazy ignoramus, and I didn't care, she said, largely because she saw him as the only way to achieve the restrictive immigration policies that she considers vital to preserving America. The most interesting defense of Trump's character is that his very flaws, or what would be flaws in most contexts, actually serve the common good. He's heedless of norms, yes, but that's an advantage when the norms are senseless or outdated. When polite opinion is wrong or destructive, someone impolite might be needed. This is part of what Trump supporters mean when they credit him, as they often do, for not being politically correct or for being a kind of battering ram against political correctness. In a thoughtful essay, my National Review colleague, Victor Davis Hanson, has made the case for Trump as a kind of tragic hero. Hanson writes, Trump is not a mannered Mitt Romney who would never have left the Paris Climate Agreement. He's not a veteran who knew the whiz of real bullets and remains a Washington icon, such as John McCain, who would never have moved the American embassy to Jerusalem. Marco Rubio or Jeb Bush certainly would never have waded into no-win controversies such as the take a knee NFL debacle and unvented immigration from suspect countries in the Middle East and Africa or called to account sanctuary cities that thwarted federal law. Our, ma our modern Agamemnon, Speaker Paul Ryan, is too circumspect to get caught up with Trump's wall or a mini trade war with China. So reads Victor Davis Hansen's case. And then a final point from Trump supporters, including members of the administration, who have been commenting on the record in response to criticisms of the president, is that whatever one thinks of Trump's character, the public's already delivered its verdict. Information about his character was widely available during the election. The topic was extensively debated during the campaign, and he emerged the victor in the Electoral College. It's time, they say, to move on, which is, incidentally, yet another echo of the pro-Clinton slogans of the late 1990s. As I said, these arguments vary in their persuasiveness. There's something to most of them. Trump's critics are wrong to dismiss them out of hand. And those of the critics who have impugned all of his supporters as deplorable racists are wrong as well. There were, in truth, many compelling reasons for intelligent people of goodwill to vote for Trump in November 2016, which is why millions of them did. His principal opponent had deep character flaws of her own, and while the view that Trump would likely yield better economic, social, and foreign policies than the presidency of his principal opponent was, of course, contestable, it was also reasonable, and in my view, largely correct. Among the reasons some voters chose Trump was that he said he would do what he could to protect unborn children from the infliction of lethal violence, while she was committed to providing government funds for the infliction of that violence. Agree or disagree with that conviction, or that judgment about how to act on that conviction, the protection of innocent life from deliberate destruction is among the weightiest reasons that can ever move citizens to base their votes. Pastor Jeffress is also correct. We are all sinners. Bill Bennett's right. Trump critics should guard against self-righteousness and moral self-congratulation. But those are arguments for humility and charity, not for refusing to condemn that which deserves condemnation not for failing to make distinctions. Yes, we're all sinners, but we're not all presidents, and not all of our sins or weaknesses have equal bearing on our trustworthiness in exercising great power. Our culture is in various ways degraded, but our choices can help to degrade it further or to elevate it. The prophet Nathan rebuked King David for his sins, rather than declaring them of no consequence or turning his attention exclusively to his enemy's faults. God loved King David, but King David repented. President Trump, by contrast, has said that he has never had to ask God for forgiveness of anything since he's never done anything wrong. Professor Kessler encourages us to compare Trump to past presidents. Certainly the more we learn about the Kennedy White House, the less it looks like Camelot and the more it looks like a harem. But our knowledge of previous presidents' vices for good or ill, was very limited at the time that they were running and in office. When Nixon's swearing was exposed in the Watergate tapes, it scandalized some of his supporters. 
We know about President Trump's adulteries, on the other hand, in part because he's bragged about them in interviews. It's better for vice to pay tribute to virtue. To vote for a president knowing he has a low character is worse than voting for him in innocence of it. And still worse is it to defend him from just criticism and to celebrate him. Those past presidents also had virtues against which to set their vices, virtues that in many cases Trump cannot claim. Many of them had served the country in uniform and displayed bravery in battle. They had taken the time to learn the basics about the government that they sought to lead. As for the suggestion that it's Trump's most widely criticized traits that have made it possible for, to, for him to accomplish so much, it calls to mind how Abraham Lincoln is said to have reacted to hearing complaints that General Grant was a drunk. He supposedly wished he could send whatever whiskey Grant favored to his other generals. One can make a strong case, as Victor Davis Hanson mentioned, that Trump has undertaken some initiatives that other Republicans would not have done. I think it is harder to make the case that these initiatives have done significant good for the country. Three of Hansen's examples essentially amount to presidential symbolism. Increasing the odds that our embassy in Israel will eventually be in Jerusalem may not be the diplomatic disaster that opponents of that policy claim, but neither does it advance US or for that matter Israeli interests in any material way. Another Republican president might have stayed in the Paris Climate Accords mostly because they're not binding. And that president might therefore have considered leaving it to yield diplomatic costs with no rewards. And whether Trump was right or wrong about the football players, no American is better off as a result of that controversy. As for the policies, the impact of most of them remains to be seen. But there's ample reason to think that, for example, his trade policies will inflict harm on many more Americans than they benefit. Whether Trump is an effective opponent of political correctness is also open to question. The term PC is, of course, not a precise term, but a large part of the phenomenon with which people take issue is the attempt to treat disagreement with certain left-wing views as though it were per se bigoted. President Trump often seems like an unwitting ally of that effort. The instant opponents of PC decide that they must become opponents of decency as well, as well they've surrendered the field. The manner in which Trump conducts himself has weakened his presidency. He commands much less loyalty from his own appointees than most presidents do. His words are frequently not taken seriously inside his own administration, let alone among his erstwhile congressional allies. Those reactions are the result of his habitual mistreatment of subordinates, his frequent irresolution, and his perceived manipul manipulability and ignorance. Compared to most presidents, he also has less ability to get a hearing from members of the public who are outside his base. How little credibility he has is indicated by the fact that most people took the word of Stephanie Clifford over him, even though she is a liar by her own admission. The more one sympathizes with Trump's policy aims, or with the policy aims he's most consistently voiced, the more frustrated he ought to find, frustrating he ought to find the president's personal weaknesses. Earlier this year, the political news website Axios reported, Trump wants action to toughen immigration laws, and he's hopping mad that it hasn't happened. He wants it, but he doesn't want it so much that he figures out what the toughest legislation he can get through Congress would be, or makes a sustained con case for that legislation, or negotiates with congressmen over its details. Instead, he's adopted the stance of an angry observer, as though he were the internet commenter in chief. The effects that Trump is having on our political culture seem likely to be baleful. He attacks all opposition and criticism as illegitimate. He labels all inconvenient news stories fake. He speaks of the Justice Department as a personal possession. His grudging and belated denunciations of hate groups have strengthened those groups. And he's flouted valuable norms, such as that a president will not launch public attacks on individual companies or comment on pending investigations. He has sometimes trampled on norms that were so well established that we'd never had occasion to articulate them as norms, as when he minimized the suffering of Puerto Ricans from the effects of Hurricane Maria. Much of his party seems to be reconstructing itself on the basis of personal loyalty to Trump rather than a belief in any particular political principle. The argument that Trump, excuse me, the argument that the public has ratified Trump's character by making him president, meanwhile, 
collides headlong with the argument, even more popular among his supporters, that for all his faults, he's better than Hillary Clinton. Many of the people who voted for him did so in spite of the traits I've been discussing, not because of them. And in any case, voters can always reassess character as they see it displayed in action. There may well be times in which a vote for a candidate with multiple serious character flaws is defensible or even obligatory. A conscientious voter must also consider the policies advocated by the different candidates and the character of the other candidates. As I said earlier, a vote for Trump, notwithstanding the evidence of severe character flaws, was defensible. One might have thought that he was the least worst of the available choices. But one danger of making that kind of choice is that it creates a temptation to rationalize, to squint very hard at the video and decide that the candidate for whom you're voting wasn't really making fun of someone for being disabled after all. To ignore stories that could be true, but paint the man you helped put in office in an unfavorable light. To minimize and extenuate the flaws. To decide that it's the people who dwell on the flaws who have the real problem, which is especially easy when you already disliked a lot of those people for partisan reasons. During the Clinton Lewinsky scandal, the late journalist Marjorie Williams interviewed Gloria Steinem about her support for Clinton. Steinem said, we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't take into account that this president and his policies are crucial to the lives and welfare of the majority of women in this country. That's not bending over backwards, that's being sensible. Having said that, if Clinton had raped women, beaten up Hillary, real private sins wouldn't be forgiven no matter what the value of the public behavior. The quote appeared at the end of Williams' story and she commented, there it is, fellas, in case you're still confused. Confused, it seems we just lowered the bar. The rationalizations deployed for Clinton may have helped feminists in the short term, but eroded the moral integrity and credibility of their movement. But there's no reason to think that other movements, other political tendencies, are immune to the temptation to make that kind of choice. And there's no reason either to think that they're immune to having to pay a price for it that's higher than they expect. As I hope I've shown, the judgments that have to be made to assess the relevance of an office holder's character to his office are, comple are complex. They're judgments, after all. They're not deductions. In making those judgments, we're saying something about the office holders. But we're also saying something about what we value, what we expect, what we are. Whatever the character of a president, it's not the character over which we have the most influence. And per perhaps one point on which the contending sides in the long-running argument about character and politics can agree is that however important the character of a political figure may be, it's secondary to our own character as a country and as a people. Thank you very much. So I'm now going to um, call on people to make questions. I'd ask that you wait to receive a microphone um, before asking it. Got one uh, right up here in the front. I should also note, yeah, I once had the opportunity to introduce the, the late, great Justice Scalia when he was giving a talk. And at the end of his remarks, he said, I will now take your questions. Please notice that I didn't say I will now answer your questions. <laughs> I'll now take your questions. Hi, uh, I'm Kyle. I'm a freshman here at Dartmouth. Um, you mentioned at the end of your speech that the, the feminist movement in a lot of ways lost credibility by defending Bill Clinton. Uh, and my question, and I, I, I can speak to personal experience with that, at any time that uh, a, a news story would come on the television about Trump uh, doing something in relation to women, my dad's immediate response was, it's okay, the feminists lost their credibility, credibility anyway, look at Bill Clinton. So my question is, is, was the GOP, or has the GOP been irreparably hurt by Trump's uh, situation, <laughs> for lack of a better term? Well, uh, it depends. Um, so uh, I think that, for example, Republicans are going to sustain losses in the midterm elections that are larger than they otherwise would because of the widespread public revulsion uh, against President Trump and the widespread perception that congressional Republicans and the Republican Party writ large have been enabling him. 
Um, so yes, I think that that is a price. Whether the, it's irreparable, sort of what the long-term consequences are, that's a different question. Um, the public seems to uh, be pretty forgiving over um, the long term to not hold one person's flaws against another person. Um, so, for example, at the end, and it's not you know it's not a precise equivalent, but at the end of um, the George W. Bush administration, many people thought that uh, that presidency ended in a way that would be discrediting of Republicans for a generation. Um, you know, you had an unpopular and disastrous war, you had an economic meltdown, a, a presidency that was in the high 20s in public approval at the end, uh, and people said in 2009, you know, Time Magazine ran a cover saying, you know, is, is, are the Republican, is the Republican Party going extinct? And then, you know, eight years later, Republicans have control of uh, all elected branches of the government, most state legislatures, most governorships. So you can bounce back pretty quickly. I do think that there is a kind of long-term and maybe difficult to quantify harm, um, you know, that certain arguments uh, just stop being able to be made um, while while passing the laugh test. Um, you know, I do think that, that the, the criticism of Trump, even just criticism of Trump, were blunted by the partisan hypocrisy um, with respect to Clinton, for example. So, I, so uh, you know, we don't know yet, um, but I do think that it is, it is possible that there, uh, I, I think there's likely there's going to be a price this year, and there could be a price in years to come as well. Um, let's see, uh, up, uh, sorry, up uh, there in the blue shirt. Hi. Um, so you did mention towards the end that some movements, when they give in to those characters, that they pay prices for them. Um, do you think that Tea Party and traditionally conservative Republicans, especially like uh, what comes to mind is Ted Cruz, um, finally giving in to Trump and supporting him as a kind of like a team base, we need to win, this is the guy we can win behind, um, do you think that sacrifices their values and virtues in the long run? Um, well. Ted, uh, I should note, uh, is uh, a, a friend of mine from college. I went to his wedding. I'm not unbiased uh, on the subject. Uh, I do think that he's got a special circumstance where his support for Trump, after Trump had attacked his wife and father, um, was particularly harmful to him uh, and to his, um, his credibility. Um, other people, their alliance with Trump is, you know, it doesn't have to overcome that particular hurdle. Uh, but I think, you know, there's a reason why th in, during this year's campaign, a lot of the attacks that Trump made on Cruz are being widely advertised. And it's to remind people um, that this is not uh, an overall story which, which can leave people with, uh, with a good feeling. Um, and, and that's what I'll say about that. Uh, yes, in the back. My name is Pete. I'm a former freshman at Dartmouth. <laughs> I wonder what role the media activity plays in the polls and the overall feeling about uh, Trump and the character of politicians. Those of us who follow things closely uh, would enjoy all the details of your speech. But uh, I wonder what, that, what percentage of the United States voters actually follow the details and what percentage actually mm. listen to whatever the media says. Uh, well, there's a third category of people who don't even pay attention. They don't pay attention or listen to the media, right? They're, they're disengaged. Uh, and there are a lot of them. I think you know, the media landscape, it's often remarked, has polarized politically. Um, we have seen a, a return to the historical norm in the U.S. of more openly partisan media. Um, but there's also a polarization in terms of the amount of political information that voters are consuming. Um, I think it's never been easier to be a, a political junkie, as it were. Um, I go When I'm going around the country and giving talks like this one, I will, you know, run into people who know the latest details on the race for the third congressional district of New Jersey, right? It is possible to do that now in a way that it didn't used to be. 
But it's also possible in a way it didn't used to be to pay no attention whatsoever to government and politics. The cultural expectation that you had to do that as part of being a good person, I think, has fallen away. And so I do think you have a little bit of a, um, an unhealthy situation where you've got this kind of feverish atmosphere among partisans on both sides, and they're trying to sway a bunch of people who don't pay any attention at all uh, to what's going on. Um, on the question of sort of how the media has affected the public perception of Trump, uh, you know, the polling suggests that more people trust the media than trust Trump to, uh, to give them the honest story. However, he's got a base of voters, roughly a third of the country, for whom the opposite is true, and the attacking the media has been an effective foil for him. Um, and I think that journalists have sometimes played into his hands uh, through, by making mistakes, uh, by being biased, uh, and, uh, and by indulging in a, in a kind of performative self-righteousness. Um, all in all, it's, uh, uh, I, I think the press has not quite figured out how to handle this president and, the, and this president's constant attacks on it. Um, yes, in blue. Hi, my name is William. I'm also a freshman here at Dartmouth. Um, one of the terms, or one of the phrases that I've heard a lot about the current administration is that it's not a, a matter of catastrophe, but it's a matter of corrosion. Mm -hmm. um, because as you said in your speech, we, in a number of ways this country is doing quite well. The economy is flourishing, um, and unemployment's at an all-time low, and um, you know we've got a right. lot of things going for us. But um, what interests me specifically is in the, the realm of international relations and how even with all of <coughs> these positive effects happening economically, um, public opinion of the United States seems to have dramatically decreased um, since Donald Trump took office. And so I was wondering what your opinion might be on how the character of the Trump administration, or of Trump in particular, might be affecting America's position on the world stage. So my impression is that um, foreign leaders in particular, um, foreign diplomats, are well aware of the fact that President Trump does not speak for all Americans or even all Republicans. Um, they don't think because Trump is saying or doing such and such that that means that's what America thinks. But I think they're also aware and factoring in that America was capable of electing him uh, and that changes their calculations and judgments about our reliability, uh, our dependability, our stability um, going forward. Uh, and I, I do think that for many countries, although not all, the, the reassessment has been negative, uh, and it will be hard to reverse, um, you know, because credibility is easy to lose and, uh, and hard to regain. Uh, yes. I'm a little bit hesitant to open my mouth here. I'm sitting here sort of stunned, and maybe I'm the only person. Um, the idea that we can compare Clinton to Trump in terms of character traits is, uh, I'm an independent, I have voted for Republicans, I don't, even, I don't even see the comparison. I think if you made a list of the problems, you would have a very long list on one side there. I don't. I don't think anybody truly cares that much about Monica or Stormy or any of that. You've talked quite a bit about sexual exploits. Um, but I do think people care about a president who um, is clearly racist and has uh, stoked more racism, lies constantly. Um, you know, I mean, his list of his, his massive apparent tax fraud, um, his adoration of dangerous dictators, 
Um, you know, he stands up there and praises Manafort and then mocks heroes, five-star families. I mean, his list is so long and so appalling that you can hardly breathe between the hits. Um, I think it could be argued uh, that much of the, um, much of what's good happening in this country right now in terms of economics, et cetera, was a lot of hard work of Obama. So now you're seeing kind of where I sit on this, but I don't think a president walks in and a year later everything's changed. He, uh, Obama inherited a mess. Um, Trump inherited an economy that was on the upswing. Um, and I just worry that in five years we're actually going to feel the vast damage that he has created in terms of climate change, in terms of div divisiveness in this country, diplomatic damage as this person has um, mentioned, and the enormous debt we're going to face because of these tax cuts. So I'm obviously in a completely mm -hmm. different world than you. <laughs> But, but comparing Clinton to Trump, I don't even see it. And I understand your argument that people see the world differently now, but the world is different now. So um, when you compare two things, you're not necessarily saying that they're equivalent. I do think that there are certain interesting similarities in the way the public argument about the relevance of character to politics has played out uh, in both of those cases. I would say... I do not believe it is right to describe the Kathleen Wiley or Juanita Broderick allegations against Clinton as being about sexual exploits. Uh, and I think that one of the things that has changed for the better is that the country has changed its view of that kind of behavior on the part of men. Um, some of the other things that you, you raise are perfectly reasonable arguments, some of them kind of outside the scope of uh, uh, the, the topic I was discussing. Um, so for example, I certainly don't believe that the strong economy that we have now is primarily the result of any policies by President Trump. I actually don't particularly think they're the result of the policies of President Obama either. I think that we all tend to overestimate the influence of public officials and particularly presidents on the performance of the economy. Um, just noting that in both cases, right, in 2017-18 and 1998-1999, you had this interplay between a strong economy and, uh, and the public argument about character. Um, so uh, nothing, you know, I don't intend to, I, to suggest, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm not trying to argue that one should regard Trump as better than Clinton or Clinton as better than Trump. That's sort of, sort of not the point I'm trying to get at. Yes. Uh, one other thing, you know, you made, the, you made, I think, a very shrewd point about the multiplicity of the uh, character flaws or alleged character flaws of Trump, I do think in an odd way it's helped him that there's just things that all by themselves would have sunk another politician, there's, there's just never enough time. Uh, and you, you sort of forget the previous scandal because it's overwhelmed by the next scandal. Um, you know, how many Americans, I'd bet you that less than 2% of Americans even know that Trump suggested, on the basis of no evidence whatsoever, that Justice Scalia had been murdered, right? That he'd been, that he'd, it was a suspicious death, and just moved, moved right on. Anyway, yeah. Okay, hi, um, I'm a sophomore here at the Dartmouth Review. Um, so, I guess the question that I have is that you contended a lot that, like, you know, we almost, parties almost like switched on a certain issue of morality at some point, especially when it came to like allegations and with the, you look at stuff like impeachment nowadays. Um, but there's also an argument that I do tend to hear pretty often that Trump is more of a symptom than he is um, anything else, if that makes any sense. So he's more of a reflection of um, the state of American democracy. Um, and with that said, I think a large part of why he did get elected is that solely because of the reason that I think a lot of Republicans were sort of done with having to deal with the issues that are associated with morality in the sense that like if like 
you know, sexual assault allegations nowadays, especially whether or not any of everyone or everything is true, um, one little thing sticks, and in, especially in years past, it would have a strong bearing on how Republicans would come to vote just because they emphasize morality so strongly. Um, so I think my question with that is, do you think that there's been a m more wide scale pattern of just m like the influence of morals in American politics declining to the sense that people might care about it less now than they ever have before? Is it that might be less of yeah. an issue? And do you think that's like a continuing trend in it? So, so you often hear um, that point of view voice, but I think it's wrong. I think that that the debate we're having as a country today suggests that the character issue is alive and well. It's just it's just sw switched over. Uh, that a majority of the public has some very serious character based, morality based problems with this president. Um, you know, if, if the question were just sort of do you approve or disapprove of um, the president's handling of the economy, uh, right now he's like, he's up three on that question, right? I mean, I think, I think the other stuff bleeds into perceptions of that, um, but, but he's still stronger on that kind of thing. It's the character stuff that I think constantly uh, pulls him and his party downward. Um, so no, I, I don't think, I, I just think that... Uh, you know the, the tides of culture shift, and uh, and we can't say sort of what's going to happen in the future that there's sort of just that these questions are going to be irrelevant from now on. You know, one way though, I think one thing that I do think has 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 mattered, I think, on the part of religious conservatives, their perception that the country is worse than it used to be has made them more willing to support Trump in a particular sense. So. In the mid-1990s, I think religious conservatives were more likely to think that they were a kind of silent majority in the country, and that they could win and rule and, and sort of you know, put their vision into public policy and change the culture. I think they're much less likely to believe that now, and they have much more of a sense of themselves as an embattled minority um, that needs protection. Uh, and that, part, that it, you know, and obviously, not true of all religious conservatives, but I think a lot of religious conservatives supported Trump on the basis, look, we've lost the culture as a whole, but he will at least uh, do things to protect us. I hear that sentiment voiced an awful lot. Yeah. I feel like a lot of what you've talked about regarding character and politics and whether or not that affects job performance or a, a person's ability to perform their job when they're serving in public office has a lot of overlap with the debate and discussion surrounding the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, right. And I was wondering if you could touch on that issue. Sure. So some of the issues, there are a bunch of overlapping debates um, that are taking place around the Kavanaugh nomination, and some of them bear more on this question of the intersection of, of character and office holding than others. So for example, some of the arguments are about, um, so if, if the Blasey Ford allegation against Kavanaugh is true, how much should it um, matter to our current assessment? But that is, I think, not been the primary argument. The primary argument has been what degree of confidence do we have in the rival stories here, right? Uh, you do sometimes hear people like Kevin Kramer, a Senate candidate on the Republican side in North Dakota, saying, um, you know, it was so long ago, boys will be boys, that sort of thing. But that has not, I think, been the prevailing line. Um, Similarly, you get this, you haven't primarily had the argument uh, over whether it would be okay for um, uh, a nominee to lie in testimony uh, before the Senate. Some people, there are a few people who have been making the argument, well, he's not lying about anything important, he was under duress and stuff, but the primary argument has been he wasn't lying, he wasn't misleading. Um, and sort of the, the sort of the empirical factual questions in both of those controversies are a little bit different. Uh, the one place where I think you do get a much clearer uh, hit on the uh, um, character and public life question is the question of whether his 
performance a week or six days ago um, shows that he's got the wrong temperament to be a judge. Um, that's been a big argument over the last week, and it's also been a it's been an interesting argument where I think the two sides are basically um, when he was too hot headed, uh, too angry, too partisan, and the other side saying, well, you know, judges are not supposed to be um, judges are not supposed to be impartial and uh, calm when addressing charges against themselves. Um, you know, the, in such cases where, uh, where their own interests are implicated, they're, they're expected to recuse. And so we have had a kind of interesting debate about that, but of course, all of this stuff is going on at the same time, uh, and, uh, and the debates have been kind of difficult to disentangle. Do we have time for one more? Okay. So um, we, ah, there we go. Sorry if I've, uh, if I've missed anybody. I'm just thinking about the election. Yeah. And Wh which election? 2016, which was basically decided in states where people were not feeling, the, well, where what uh, Trump was offering was to deal with the issues of all the people that were out of work um, and had other uh, issues of kind of hopelessness. And so how the whole country feels about the balance between character and, uh, and a candidate mm -hmm. might be a little different in the states, and there are only three or four of them, which really uh, decide these elections anymore or in the current uh, time. Well, he, he won the presidency uh, with 77,000 votes in three states. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a lot went into that. I think it's, it is right to say that um, public opinion varies a lot by place and by group. Um, California and Wisconsin probably have different attitudes about these things. Um, interestingly, you know, there's been a ton of research on the question of the extent to which economic hardship um, was predictive of somebody's vote in 2016. Um, I think the general consensus is that it wasn't terribly predictive. Um, one thing that seems to have been pretty predictive is if you're in a place that is uh, um, seeing a lot of opioid-related deaths, um, that tended to correlate with uh, Trump vote, um, although you know even that's controversial because there are a lot of potential confounding factors in it. Um, I guess one last point I would make, you know, is a lot of the Trump, a lot of the people who voted for Trump, certainly enough to swing the election in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Michigan, were people who had serious misgivings about President Trump, but for one reason or other decided that he was preferable to Hillary Clinton. Um, so when he's on the ballot against somebody who is not Hillary Clinton, you know, do they make a reassessment? Um, do they like what they've seen from Trump so far? Uh, I think you know, a, lot of, a lot of those voters uh, were people who'd voted for Obama twice. Uh, and I would not say that they're necessarily a lock um, to, uh, to vote for Trump again or to vote for Republicans this year. Scott Walker seems to be in a fair amount of trouble in Wisconsin right now, for example, um, which allows me to end on two notes, the first being, we shall see, and the second being, again, thank you so much. You've been a terrific audience.